G'day, my name's Dave Sammet. Now we all know what oxygen is. It's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. It's in the air that we breathe, we need it to live. But everything that we know about oxygen, about living cells and why it's required, comes from science. But let's go back 250 years to when we were first learning all about it. So it's 1774, Lieutenant James Cook has just returned from his first voyage of discovery. The scientists of the day were called natural philosophers and they were just beginning to learn about how the world worked. Now at the time, we only knew of about a dozen elements and along came a man by the name of Joseph Priestley who was about to make an important new discovery. Now we all know that when you put a candle in a jar, it's gonna burn itself out. But back in 1774, we did, the, the natural philosophers of the day, they didn't know why this happened. They had an idea, and it was a pretty darn good idea considering the science of the day. The idea was that when they looked at the candle, they could see that the candle was getting smaller and they could see the flame. So they figured that there must be something in the candle itself that was coming out. And they called this stuff phlogiston. Basically their idea was that this is flame, as in the old earth, wind, fire, water. Joseph Priestley was doing some really interesting experiments on gases and in, in 1774 he was about to do his most important experiment, his most famous experiment to date. He was working with a material called red calx. Now red calx is a mercuric oxide and what he found was when he focused the sun's rays through a magnifying glass on this red calx it actually broke down and it released a new gas something new that, they hadn't, that he hadn't seen before. When he sniffed it, he described it as light and easy to breathe. Now the really great, uh, sorry, don't try this at home folks. The, the other aspect of red calx is mercury, which is incredibly poisonous. And so when I'm doing this uh, today, I'm just using a red powder that looks like red calx. Now Joseph Priestley discovered that when he had the red calx in his jar with him, then the new gas would cause the candle to burn brighter and longer. And I've got a shot of that from a recent experiment that, 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 that we did. But let's come back to our hydrogen peroxide. I said you can turn it into water and oxygen by adding chemicals. One chemical you can add to make it do this is potassium permanganate or Connolly's crystals. But all we need is a small amount of that and we should produce some oxygen into the glass and there's something being produced, it's a gas. If I light a piece of wood, wooden splint, it's an old broken ruler, I should be able to plunge it into the oxygen and let's see what happens. It glows more brightly. If I blow it out, it rekindles from glowing wood to burning wood. And that certainly is one of the things that oxygen can do, it can make things burn. Joseph Priestley's most important discovery was that this new gas was critical to life itself. What he found was if he put a cute little mouse in the jar with his red calx and he made this new gas, that little mouse would, la would live four to five times longer. And he also discovered that if he puts a plant in the jar with the mouse, that that mouse will live even longer still. He discovered that plants create oxygen. Now, nobody's perfect. Joseph Priestley interpreted his results in terms of the dominant theory of the day, in terms of phlogiston theory. His idea was that this new gas must be particularly low in phlogiston, and he called it dephlogisticated air, and the idea was that more phlogiston could come out before the candle would burn itself out. It wasn't for another 20 years before a French scientist by the name of Antoine Lavoisier did his own experiments with this, he did weights and measurements and all sorts of things, and he separated the gas and called it oxygen. Now that's the great thing about science. We discover something new, we find some interesting new observation. We come up with an idea about what that means. We test that idea and we test it some more. And we try and ultimately, we try to disprove this idea. We try to prove it wrong. And if you can't prove it wrong for long enough, if enough people try, then that's when something becomes called scientific fact. That's the great thing about science. It's always able to change. Thanks very much.